sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings being chained up or getting beaten. When David and Louise Turpin last saw their children, some of them were in shackles. Today, a stunning final chapter in a case that horrified the world. What some are calling a house of horrors inside a family home in Southern California. 13 siblings living in deplorable conditions, tortured by their own parents. Now at their sentencing hearing, face to face with some of their children for the first time since pleading guilty to multiple counts of torture and false imprisonment. I cannot describe in words what we went through growing up. Cameras tilted down to protect the victim's identity. One daughter wounded but resilient. My parents took my whole life from me, but now I'm taking my life back. Their son reading aloud a message on behalf of his sister of forgiveness and grace. I just want to thank them for teaching me about God and faith. I hope that they never lose their faith. Their father, David, unable to cope. So emotional, he dished off his statement to his attorney. I never intended for any harm to come to my children. I'm sorry if I've done anything to cause them harm. His wife, Louise, seemingly full of regret. I pray for my children every day. I want to say again, I'm truly sorry. I am for everything I've done to hurt them. I love them more than they could ever imagine. The two were stoic as their sentences were handed down 25 years to life, with the possibility of parole in 22 years. Would you say that justice has been done? I believe it has. I think that the punishment of 25 to life is, is what you get in California for first degree murder. I think that's equivalent to what these two individuals did. They took lives in a different way. They robbed their own children of what, what they could have been. But it was the children who fought for their freedom. I live in a family of 15 people, and my parents are abusing, they abuse us, and my two little sisters right now are chained up. This audio exclusively obtained by ABC News is our first time hearing from any of David and Louise Turpin's children about the abuse and torture to which the parents pleaded guilty in February. And how many of your siblings are tied up? Two of my sisters, one of my brothers. How are they tied up, with rope or with what? With chains, they're, on the, they, they're chained up to their bed. Authorities say it was just before 6 a.m. when the Turpin 17-year-old daughter swiped a deactivated cell phone, scrambled out of her bedroom window, and made that call. The reason I ran away from home was because the chains were making places on, and, and they would wake up at night and they would start crying and they wanted me to call somebody and tell them. Her voice high pitched, sounding a decade younger than her near 17 years, but her purpose clear. And so I wanted to call, I wanted to call y'all so y'all could help my sisters. Her courage couldn't be understated. She risked being chained herself if caught. Okay, so you're just around the corner from your house, is that right? Uh. Yeah, I think. I'm not sure. I've never been out. I don't go out much, so I don't know anything about the streets or anything. That call would ultimately free the rest of her siblings and land her parents in jail. You've got parents that are torturing their children, causing them pain, causing them suffering over a prolonged period of time through malnourishment, through physical abuse, through psychological abuse. It, it's, it's horrific. That 911 call shattering the image of what seemed a big, happy family. David Turpin once had a steady job with aviation giant Northrop Grumman, the Turpin's Facebook profile featuring family trips, like this one to Disneyland. The children so often dressed in identical clothing, sometimes numbered. The family of 15 lived in a quiet suburb. This community here in Paris, California is known as the crown jewel of this little town. It's kind of a place where kids play out on the street unchaperoned, where people keep their lawns tidy and manicured, and where neighbors talk to neighbors. Did you ever actually see the kids yourself yeah. outside? Not, not outside, but... Neighbor Mike Clifford, who works the graveyard shift, says he did see something odd, though, late at night. You know, I'd come home and 
anywhere from 12.30 to 3 in the morning, is the kids marching between those two rooms up there. At 12.30 to 3 o'clock in the morning? That's when I get home and that's when I would see them. And, and how long would they march back and forth for in, in single file? Hours. At the time, the children ranged in age from 2 to 29. Seven of them were actually adults, but looked so much younger because of severe malnutrition. To give you an example, one of the children at age 12 is the weight of an average seven-year-old. When deputies found the 12 siblings, what were the conditions that they encountered in that house? They're horrible. Conditions are, are absolutely deplorable. They're, it's, it's smelled as filthy. Um, it's clear that some of the victims, when they're chained, are not being taken to the bathroom to relieve themselves. The Turpin 17-year-old daughter describing the conditions they lived in in that 911 call. We live in filth, and sometimes I wake up and I can't breathe because how dirty the house is. These pictures show one of the Turpin's Texas homes years ago. Grime smeared on the stairwells, human filth on the floors, scratches on the backs of doors and walls that the new owners had assumed were made by animals. When was the last time you had a bath? Uh, uh, I don't know, almost a year ago. But sometimes I feel so dirty, I wash my face and I wash my hair. Their mother's neglect, the 17-year-old said, was systemic. I don't know much about my mother. She doesn't like us. She doesn't spend time with us ever. Who takes care of you? Uh, I, I take care of myself, and mother does buy food for us, so she feeds us, but we never talk. They were afraid that anything that they got was going to be taken away. Mark Uffer is the CEO of the Corona Medical Regional Center, where the children spent two months recovering after they were rescued. His cabinet filled with mementos the siblings left behind. They seem to have had an enormous impact on the hospital, on the nurses, on the doctors, and you. You know, what initially started out as uh, uh, patients coming in through the emergency room uh, turned into um, sort of a higher calling, higher calling for all of us. We, uh, uh, essentially adopted them. The sunset over. Despite the years of abuse and lack of education, Upper says the children showed raw talent. She wanted to know about horseback riding. Okay. And they took a great interest in horseback riding. So I said, well, you know, do you have a picture of a horse? And I said, I do have a picture of him. So I showed her this picture on a Friday. And when I came back in uh, Monday morning, they had created this picture. A little over a year after that fateful phone call and their dramatic rescue, the 13 children are doing well. While the youngest remained cared for, the attorney for the eldest seven says his clients are branching out. All seven of our clients are, are living more or less on their own. Five are living in, in apartments. Together. Uh, close to each other. And they get together all the time to see each other. How many are going to college? Right now, uh, five are going to college. Although the future remains uncertain for a group in a far different place today than they were in their father's Facebook pictures, it is full of possibility. They are shackled no more. For Nightline, I'm Matt Gutman in Riverside, California. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.